Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our session today on unschooling math and, of course, STEM. And we're going to talk about um, everything math and STEM in unschooling. So welcome if you're new to the concept of unschooling or self-directed learning. And um, welcome if you're well-versed in it. I hope to add some um, new information for you today in, in that whole realm of alternative education. Big thank you to Errol and Peter and Jerry for um, letting me participate in this great conference. And let's get started. Okay, so... Um, so this is, you're in the right session. Um, they'll learn calculus when they need to learn calculus. And I thought I'd call it that because very often um, I go to places and talk about unschooling and you always get a question in the crowd like, well, what about calculus? You know, they're gonna have to know that when if they're going into a STEM career. And um, yes, and, and it's a very common question, very valid. But um, it there's a whole bunch of assumptions built in there, especially that math has to be learned incrementally and in steps, and it has to begin in preschool. Even there's um, a lot of preschool teachers that are learning pre or teaching pre math skills, and that's all um, okay. But there are also um, ways to learn math through daily life, just through living, and that's what we call er experiential math and it builds it builds but maybe not on paper maybe kids don't have to use math and worksheets to build their math skills so that's what we're going to kind of explore today so this is me I um I'm certified in the growing brain from zero to five I have brain story certification and my real job outside of um, growing my kids has been to teach um, child development for a few health and organizations. I'm also an author. I have written quite a few books on non-punitive parenting. And because I raised five children without punishing them, I um, just can't handle that in education either. I think education should be free, totally free of punishments, whether that's punishing by marks or detentions or anything like that. So um, some of my books have been um, translated into foreign languages. And then my one book on education is called Unschooling to University. And yeah, I'll talk a little bit more about that why I wrote them. We, I also founded Unschooling Canada Association. Hello from Canada. We're, <laughs> we're, it is 26 degrees out there today. So it's wonderful. We're not always that cold. And if you want to learn more, please join our Facebook group called Unschooling STEM. Um, and I think that was important because there is this thinking out there that if people unschool, they're their kids are only going to get into the arts or maybe have to start a business. Um, we know now living in our society that um, STEM skills are very, very important. They are absolutely necessary for a whole host of um, jobs and careers that are in science, technology, engineering, mathematics. And the one core basic subject for STEM skills is mathematics. It's very important. And I just want to tell everybody out there that just because um, you choose an unschooling or an alternative route doesn't mean that you have to rule out those future careers for your children. They are just as qualified to go into STEM fields, even if they start a more formal program late in life, like we're talking 17, 18, 19. Okay, and we'll talk about that later. Um, I have a blog, Unschooling to University, which kind of follows up a bit more on my book. And I have a parenting blog as well. So um, we love teachers. I think teachers do the best they can in a system that needs work. <laughs> 
And um, sometimes we just get sick of banging our heads against the wall in that system that doesn't work. And sometimes um, we stay in the system and try and change it. But again, not much changes. And then we decide to pull out. That's why we unschool. So what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to show you quite a lot of slides and um, I'd like to present and then we'll, um, I'm going to finish about probably, a little, probably about 11, I hope, and then we'll have a half an hour Q&A there. Okay, so thank you. So what is the problem with our education system today? What do kids bring to school and when do they lose it? And you look at those little four or five year olds, they're bringing curiosity and passion and and so much excitement about learning. And somewhere between the ages of five and 15, they really do lose it. Now, when they're learning STEM skills, it's really important to ask those what if questions. What if we planted an egg? Will it grow an egg tree? What if we combine vinegar and baking soda? What will happen? And all through early childhood, their whole attitude is, let's find out. I remember when my two-year-old went, open the fridge door and the eggs are at his eye level and he grabs an egg and drops it on the floor. That's a STEM skill. He's he has that whole attitude of let's find out what happens. Um, and then mom comes in yelling, <laughs> which happens, but it's science in action. And then kids get to a certain age when they have had way too much formal institutionalized schooling where they get to the point, well, who cares what happens? I don't care. I'm never going to use this in the real world. And between ages five and 15, they lose their love of learning. And that's why I think unschooling, which is they direct their learning, they decide what they want to find out about is so important. So curiosity and creativity are two things very much needed in science, mathematics, engineering, and technology. Um, and we want to preserve those those learning skills, curiosity, creativity. Curiosity is, well, what would happen? And creativity is, let's try this. So very much important. Worldwide high school dropout rate, I know at least in Canada is anywhere from about 70 to 80%, not 80, not 70 to 80%, 20%. But in certain sectors, it can be, much, much higher. And that's kind of sad because that's telling us that kids are not getting what they need to learn in the system. So the solution can be self-directed education. So for those of you new to unschooling, just going to give you a little bit of information here. Um, so self-directed is the child decides what to learn, when to learn, how to learn, where to learn, and if they're going to learn certain topics. So it's it's not giving them control. It is empowering them to take ownership of their education a lot sooner than we would in a school system. So in from even age two years old, them deciding what book they want to read to when they're 18 and them deciding what they want to learn more of in any, any field whatsoever. And anybody can learn anything anywhere. We have the internet. When I raised my five kids, we were just starting to have the internet. And we have all this content now at our fingertips and anybody can learn anything they want to. Um, I use YouTube all the time to look things up I wanna learn about. It's right there. But, um, like many people, I started, <laughs> so I pulled my kids, I'll tell you a little bit about our background. I have five children, so I have four sons and a daughter, and when the oldest two were two, um, were in grade two, I pulled them out of school because the system wasn't working for them. One had a learning disability, the other one was bored, 
So I thought, okay, let's homeschool. I'll try this out, see how it goes. And we did. We pulled them out to homeschool. And then by November that year, I was yelling a lot to get the work done. And I thought, I'm destroying my relationship with my kids. I don't want to punish them to do the work. They're not doing the homeschooling assignments. And I just, one day we were all in tears. You can see one of my kids wrote on their math book, I hate mathematics, because he just hated doing worksheets. So we let it go. We just let it go and played for the next 10 years. And somewhere in that play, he regained his love of mathematics because he's an engineer now. He must have <laughs> got it from somewhere. Um, and then we did a more self-directed high school. So we followed our provincial outcomes, but we did it our way, the way we wanted to do it. And when and they had a lot of knowledge to add. And when the kids were stuck, um, especially, you know, during calculus, grade 12 math, that's really hard stuff. Um, we did employ the use of some tutors to help out. And um, they went on to university. So um, all four kids, five kids were accepted into universities. Four kids went into STEM careers in engineering, bioscience, chemistry, and mathematics. So the, the fifth one went into humanities. <laughs> so there are lots of ways to learn what we know today. And students are borderless. We do not have to be bound by our government curriculum, by our government's um, anything. We can, we can absolutely learn from anywhere. So unschooling is a philosophy and lifestyle of educational freedom in which a child's natural curiosity, creativity, and motivation nurtured in a stimulating environment will lead the child to learn what he or she needs to know in the time frame he or she needs it. That is a definition of unschooling. So I, I like to show this little graph. So um, every, we all unschool until age six or five. Um, all our kids unschool until age five. They play, they learn through play. And at age five, most of us say, okay, you have to go to school now. You can't just spend your days playing and you have to learn what the government wants you to learn. And a lot of that creativity and curiosity is lost because it's no longer owned by the child. The learning is no longer owned by them. The school pressures, coerces them to learn. Um, and then what a lot of unschoolers do is just keep on playing. They learn through play all through the teen years. And what we've seen is around age 17, which kind of fits with that development of their prefrontal cortex, their executive function, their self-control, is that they want to do more formal um, qualifications in order to get into the post-secondaries that they want, their programs they want to. And they, in those few years here, 17, 18, 19, they can learn a compressed um, version because their brains are ready and they can get into the programs they want, right? The exams they need to qualify. I witnessed this with my five kids. It's, I witnessed this with 30 of friends, kids, and it does really work. All you need to unschool is a facilitator that's an adult, can be a teacher, a parent, a caregiver, a grandparent to help kids get what they need. Resources, and it can be very basic, like a library card or the internet, or you can have 200 educational items in the home like we did. And Kids need a lot of free time, free time to learn what they want to learn. And that's basically it. It's pretty easy to unschool. You just provide a lot of time and you offer whatever they want to learn from. This little guy is now going into a mathematics career. So what do kids do all day? We often get that question too. And they do, they don't sit around and play video games all day, although that is a big component of it. And as a family of five 
gamer kids, I must say gaming really does help those STEM skills. But this is what they do all day. They play, they research, they game, they do chores, they go on field trips, we travel, cook, crafts, projects, volunteer, explore, maybe run a small business when they're older. They're very busy and they learn through all these activities. Learning is not just constrained to textbooks and workbooks and classroom assignments. Now, there's 61 benefits of unschooling. I've put them together in five chapters of my book, Unschooling to University. I'm not going to go through them today, but the main ones are motivation is never a problem. If your child is going to a self-directed learning school or a self-directed learning program, if motivation is a problem, it's not self-directed or self-chosen. The child's always developmentally ready for whatever they want to learn. Um, for an example, I used to take my kids when they were like eight, eight, nine, 10, 11 to museums. They were not interested in reading the displays and looking at all the pictures until they reached the age about 15. 15 onwards is when they really got the most out of travel and museums. This is a museum we went to in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. And that's probably when their brain starts developing more executive function, more abstract thinking skills. They can really synthesize they're learning from um, more complicated ways to learn other than play. So these are some of the advantages of unschooling. And I'm not going to talk about this, but <laughs> but this, um, I want to show this. So when I talk about, about age 17, that's when the prefrontal cortex takes that final leap. This is from the brain story course. And from 17 to 25, that is the, the optimum your brain is going to be and your kids' brain is going to be. And that's where they really can, their self-control is very, very good. Their focus, their working memory, and their planning is optimum. And that's why kids can learn about eight grades of math in one year. Even around age 13, that's when all my kids took their first math course on paper was grade eight. And people say, well, you can't do eight grades of math in one year. And we say, well, they have learned math since birth experientially, but now they're learning how to do it in paper. And because they have their abstract thinking skills, it comes really fast and really easy. So um, this is an example. Um, my, I got this email from my mom when, or my son when he was in engineering school. And he said, hey, mom, these days I'm doing analysis on oscillating machines, like a door stopper. So when he was two years old, he would lie on his stomach like this, and he would just twang those door stoppers just to, just to see what they would do, <laughs> see what happens. And that is experiential learning. So when he's in a sound engineering class, he has that knowledge, that experience background layers of experience to inform him when he's doing the theoretical paperwork. So I kind of talked a bit about us, um, our five kids. Um, I, yeah, <laughs> when my kids finally did do a more self-directed high school, they did in our province, we have grade 12 exams, and that was their average compared to the provincial average. So unschooling really, really does work. I think exams are a good way to measure the, the learning. They got scholarships. They were um, they applied to 11 Canadian universities. And we have four university graduates so far. Like I said, four of the five kids went into STEM careers. And then when my friends as kids and their friends is who unschooled, they all started going to post-secondaries at the same time, entering colleges and universities. And that's the point where I thought, I got to write a book on this because it's got to get out there that that's probably one of the first questions 
other than socialization is how will they get to university? How will they get to college if they don't do formal education? So the book talks about how these 30 kids went. They unschooled anywhere from three to 12 years. They were all accepted to college, technology, and universities. 22 of them have already graduated. Two have gone on to master's and finished. And we actually had 10 in STEM, 10 in humanities, and 10 in the arts. Four of them went into engineering. So somewhere along the way, they did learn math. Um, I'm going to quickly go through the age groups, but I, I do want to show you this. This is learning is a biological process. So what this is, is neurons in the brain. So this is one neuron connecting with another neuron. This is learning in action. And how the learning happens is this neuron sends a neurotransmitter down this axon, down over this gap, this synapse here to the neighboring dendrite, into the neighboring neuron. And this neurotransmitter going across the gap is the process of learning. Let's just play this, here it comes. There we go. And this happens whether a child is learning from a math worksheet or from a video game. It's all the same biological process. So during COVID, when everyone out there is saying, oh, kids are suffering learning losses, they are so behind, what they're really talking about is kids are behind on the government agenda. It's not that they stopped learning. They learned a whole lot of other things that are not on the government agenda, which are probably more relevant to them because it makes sense. It's self-directed. So play grows those brain connections just as much as workbooks. Absolutely, we cannot discard play. And play continues even in the teen years. It looks a little different than a five-year-old. How a 15-year-old plays, it tends to go more online, but it does happen and it does continue teaching. So I'm gonna um, talk a little bit about, <laughs> I'm running out of time, so I'm going to uh, just kind of quickly, quickly, quickly go through stages. So um, you'll see a lot of toys marketed as, as STEM toys, and especially for babies and toddlers, building math skills. And it's true, children young do build math skills, but not in the ways we think. A lot of them are very much learned through their environment. They can pick out colors and shapes. They start counting even without being taught. So it's pretty interesting to see that. So I'm just gonna not go through the toddler thing here. So let's just start from six to 12. And so at age six to 12, the frontal brain is where most development is not the prefrontal cortex yet, but the frontal brain. And that is where kids really start to build skills and build relationships. They can think logically, concretely, but it has to be tangible. It can't be abstract yet until puberty. So um, a lot of their learning is what they pick out in their environments. Um, so they build this knowledge through experiential learning, through all their five senses, hearing, seeing, touching, smelling, and talking. They're not putting things in their mouths anymore, so not tasting. But they, the, most, the best way to learn during these ages of ages six to 12 is through going out in their community, um, learning about things they wanna learn at home, going on field trips, travel is fantastic, getting into groups, um, even um, a lot of lessons or activities that are community-based with other kids. They get the socialization in and they get the experiential learning by doing, not by just sitting and doing worksheets. So how do you build that let's find out mentality. How do you build those math skills? How do you build 
um, propensity for interest in science and technology and, and mathematics. Well, there's lots of books, internet, video gaming, board games are really good. Lots of free play, lots of adult conversations. Um, here's my kids playing dominoes. I mean, that is just fantastic for spatial awareness. A um, lot of math skills there. Um, going for walks in nature, open-ended games like chess. Um, we used to go to recyclers to take apart appliances. We used to join maker groups. We used to get kids um, scientific equipment like a 3D printer, microscope, telescope. Nice to have, not necessary to have. You can find those at maker groups. Get them in the kitchen, the workshop, sewing, the garden. Um, we used to have craft cupboards that they could just bring out materials. Get them playing with Lego, connects, blocks. Take them to zoos, aquariums, science centers. Um, there's lots of ways to, to expand that. Um, more ways is get pets. There's living biology. Give them chores, um, host clubs allows supervised exploration of water, dirt, fire, metal, and wood, especially supervise the fire, <laughs> but emphasize the safety part too. Um, I was often asked, what about STEM classes? Should I sign my kids up for a STEM day camp? And I asked my kids that and they said, no, it was too prescribed. It wasn't open-ended where you could find out what you wanted to know. It was a prescriptive project that they had to do and what that is is the teacher controls it not the child they want to control over what they would learn through those kinds of things so um, in my book I do outline lots of toys and board games computer games that teach different subjects so here um and this is on my blog too, Unschooling to University. Science, lots of toys, board games, and computer games. Mathematics, wonderful board games to build those math skills. There's a lot of them out there. Lots of toys. If you have spare cash, go garage sailing. Lots of toys that build mathematics. I'm just giving, you know, a preschooler a measuring tape. And letting them discover how it works is just interesting. I used to give them the measuring tapes from Ikea to keep them busy while I was shopping. Building math skills in obscure places and computer games. And I think your attitude matters the most um, in encouraging STEM curiosity and creativity. Having a yes attitude. So if your child wants to go in your kitchen and start mixing things or wants to um, learn how to use a handsaw and build a project, saying yes, and depending on their age, supervising, making space and time to supervise is, is important. Tolerating mess is important. Not fixing their creations is important. They need to make mistakes to learn. So um, I'm going to maybe I'll just talk a little about about reading and um, unschooling. So most kids learn to read on their own. Um, we don't really teach reading. Um, most people assume reading happens in schools because that's where kids when they learn to read, that's where it happens. Um, reading is a developmental skill usually appears anywhere between ages five and seven on average. And those are the years kids are in school. So we assume teachers teach, but all kids learn to read if they're in a stimulating environment on their own, just as they learn to use the toilet. And they do eventually learn to sleep through the night. <laughs> it really is a self skill. My kids learn to read at different ages. Um, I have to say a lot of the relatives were worried when the nine and 10 year old weren't reading yet, but a year later, you couldn't tell who started at 10 and who didn't. They were reading books this thick. Learning to write, same thing too. Um, 
my kids were always online. So they had a really kitchen, really a chicken scratch as writing. This is my one of my son's um, lab reports in university. I don't know how that professor could read that. <laughs> but he realized he needed to learn how to write cursive. So he got a grade one book and started practicing. And this was what his results were three months later. So when kids need to learn something, they will learn it. I have so many examples of this. I might might just do a whole webinar once on um, here's here's what you think and here's what they can do, right? It just dispels the myths that kids learn when they need to learn it. Um, so, and teenagers too, absolutely. So let's talk about math. Um, math really can come into play. The more theoretical math can be easily understood once children get their abstract thinking skills. So around age 13, 14, they're moving into higher order math, pre-calculus um, and those things. But math is about just solving everyday problems. It's a set of tools used to solve problems. And that's why it's the gateway to all the STEM careers. Here's an example. One day we had a birthday in our house and we ordered half a cheesecake from the local cheesecake shop. And when we got it out of the box, it didn't really look like a full half. <laughs> it looked like this. <laughs> and so I said to the kids, okay, we need to use math to solve this problem. Let's see if we really got half the cheesecake because a half was a lot less expensive than a whole one. And that was a good learning opportunity to teach them how to work out some circumference and pi. So we did it on paper. I brought out pieces of paper and I said, okay, we measure this, we times it by 3.14, we get this. And then we measured and we thought, okay, we don't get this. This isn't half a cheesecake. So we called up the cheesecake shop and said, hey, I think somebody sliced a whole inch off right there and showed them the pictures. And they said, yes, here's a coupon for a full cheesecake. <laughs> but that's how you teach kids curiosity, learning tools, and how to work out problems, especially math problems. Um, now, I, I do believe from observation, this is just my own anecdotal observation of my five kids. Grade eight was the pivotal year, which is age 13, that they could shift from learning math through play to actually working out formulas on paper. That was the magic year. So they learned math through play. They learned all of these things through play. And I talk about how they learned it in, in my book, Unschooling to University. But um, just by observing, if you, they, if you have a bunch of kids and you divide out a pizza, they are very good at what five eighths looks like versus one quarter, right? They experience that. But then you want to teach them how to work that out on paper which is the bigger fraction. But they learn these all experientially through just through play. And they learn more things through play. Roman numerals, they learned about through reading Asterix and Obelix books. Time, they learned about the 24 hour clock through visiting airports and visiting hospitals, the two places that do run on 24 hour clocks. Um, temperature, that's an easy one. If you have a thermometer around, they quickly learn that. And same with degrees. They learn that it, with temperature. Angles, properties, if you um, visit, travel, you'll learn about sundials. They'll learn about sundials and all these things. Ordered pairs and coordinates. Playing battleship is one of the best ways to learn that. So these are all examples of what kids learn through play. Then age 13, like I said, then they can combine eight years of experiential math and start putting it together on paper um, if they want to. And again, motivation is the key. But if they're already keen to go, if they love math and we don't create a math phobia 
by eight years of failure and doing bad on paper, we create a love of math. And a lot of kids are are really good at math and just have this blockage. So I really advocate not starting worksheets until grade eight. This is a um, wall display from the a university in was Western Australia. No, a museum in Western Australia. And it is, this is water. So you can just turn this whole thing and the water will fill these two squares. So you can see a math concept in action. These things are really valuable. Um, I have to say, we had a lot of math manipulatives, board games, um, things around our house. And I wouldn't do anything. I wouldn't say anything. I just put them out there and the kids would play with them. And through playing, they'd make their own observations and their own learnings. And they didn't, they weren't fearful to approach them. So I kind of talked about this. So calculus, um, four of my kids needed calculus to move on to university courses. Two of them took their first calculus course in university. So they upgraded. Um, you can take it as an additional course. And two of mine took calculus before they entered university. So let's just take one kid, for example. This is the kid that's going into math. His first math course was grade eight. Um, then he skipped grade nine. And then when he was 18, he decided to take math 10, 11, 12. So this was day one, his first math course in a school in grade 10. And look how awful his numbers are. <laughs> Just awful. They're not lined up. And of course, you know, if you don't line up your numbers, you're not going to, you're going to get wonky answers because nothing is, is very straight. And then after practice, after two months, this was his lettering. Pretty nice and neat. Very nice and neat. So then he took his three grades of math in high school, and then he went on to calculus at age 19. Um, actually, he took it simultaneously with grade 12. And he was ready. His brain was ready. He did very well. Occasionally, there were bumps along the road where he um, needed help, and we would hire tutors to help him out. But for the most part, he could self-teach a lot of it, too. And his motivation was high because he wasn't slogging through 12 years of math classes. He only had three years plus the grade eight class in high school. So his motivation was very high. So kids can self-learn most knowledge of what they need. Absolutely, they can. So if you want to encourage um, STEM education as teenagers, there's lots of ways to do that too. Again, same as school agers, books, internets, lectures, Khan Academy is really fantastic. Um, projects, um, when they do projects of their own, like building a 3D printer, they are going to require math skills and they learn the formulas as they go. Um, Blogs, gaming really helps, structured experiments, maker groups, again, and lots of working out math problems at home and in the community. Okay, I'm not going to, I just want to add maybe in the last five minutes here, um, what if they play video games? How does that contribute to learning math? Um, I think it contributes a lot. Again, I'll tell you, I had five gamers <laughs> as kids, probably got it from their gamer uh, father. <laughs> um, this picture is one day, one day I was just sick of all the gaming and I told the kids, just go outside and play, go get out. And they did. And about an hour later, it was super quiet. I hadn't heard from them. And I went outside and here they were playing Nintendo through the glass um, patio doors <laughs> outside on the deck. They were very smart. Um, but if they do play video games all day, the, the research right now on video games is that there needs to be a balanced life. But 
there used to be very strict guidelines from the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Canadian Pediatric Society on hours of screen time for each age groups. I was still teaching child development when it was 90 minutes a day for ages six to 12. Now there are no timelines. There's no guidelines because our world is so digital and screens are everywhere. What we do know currently from neuroscientists is that kids who are raised in an environment with no toxic stress from adverse childhood experiences will not develop a gaming addiction, no matter how many hours they play video games it will not have adverse effects on them. So as long as young kids, um, there is research out there that little kids from ages zero to five, if they do not have rich conversations and language that they're hearing and interacting with, they can have language delays. But if they still have screen time and have that rich language and conversations, it's not a problem. And of course, there's balance, right? Having tech-free times for adults and kids is good for all of us. Working in that exercise, social meal times, and healthy sleep hygiene practices will help moderate and balance out all the hours of screen time we have. But let's face it, there's some fantastic um, math webinars out there on YouTube. There's some fantastic, um, um, lots of really good games that teach math skills and science and all kinds of information. And math and STEM skills are a precursor for our gaming industry. Esports is a global $180 billion industry that is actually double the revenues of the film industry right now and they need stem skills video gaming leads to skills that lead to stem careers in programming engineering and cybersecurity, which are all growing fields so if you we live in a digital culture and to deny kids um time and it takes time but to deny kids time in learning and immersed and playing in that digital culture is, um, is, I think, holding them back a bit. I really do. So I realize that every family has different opinions. Um, I try and follow the opinions of neuroscientists and the research that comes out of that. So um, anyways, that's my little bit I'm saying on that. <laughs> Um, all games teach STEM skills, problem solving, creativity, innovation, coding, and math. And where I see there's a huge shortfall is in girls and gaming. Um, what games build executive function skills, the development of that prefrontal cortex, they demand attention, they demand planning, organizing, patience that's that um self self-control bit um critical thinking and of course emotional management they teach coding so um in scripting and building mods good good stem skills there and they actually build people skills too especially those group video games i've watched my kids in guilds and teams um they have a team of five that they regularly play PUBG and it's great, great people skills in um, working together, working towards a common goal, displaying empathy when one person loses. But all these things are really important um, in math careers, in STEM careers, and they can be honed definitely by games and other people interaction and age appropriateness is the key but get your girls gaming on um <laughs> we you know like we need to give our boys dolls because they're going to grow up and become dads and obstetricians and we need to give our girls gaming because they're going to grow up to be scientists and engineering engineers too 
So, and they're just as good at gaming. It's just that it's not biology. I think we socialize them out of it. Um, and you can tell, um, you'll never see Halo marketed with pink and <laughs> glitter to appeal to girls, right? It is very subtle socialization. Um, I would say these, these are common ads I see for STEM classes. And you can see here, the boy is doing the doing and the girl's looking on. Here's another one where there's one girl and there's seven, six boys in this STEM class. And girls are seeing that. They're saying, I don't belong. I don't see myself there. And you can't be what you can't see. So I think we really need to encourage girls in math, in um, STEM skills, in gaming, in esports. So um, I'm going to end it there pretty well, but I just want to, to um, let you know that kids do all these things on their own. When they're one years, they learn to walk. We don't teach them. It's a developmental skill. When they're three years, they learn to talk. We don't teach them. They model and mimic what we do. When they're seven years, they learn to read, print, do basic arithmetic. They learn times tables and keyboarding. All fantastic math skills just by living in our very, very digital world. In 13, they learn to write. They learn to do mathematics, coding, spreadsheets, game modding, and they do it. A lot of it self-taught, much of it self-taught. I My math skills end in grade eight. So most parents can help kids up to grade eight. And from grade eight onwards, um, which is 13, um, then they hire tutors or they, or kids self-teach. We can't underestimate how much kids can self-teach themselves and learn through finding their own resources. It's amazing. We look at a little seven-year-old and we think, oh, they depend on me for everything. I have to teach them everything. And yet by 13, they're, they're overriding you. They're, they're, they know so much more than you're knowing. And it's really amazing to watch these little guys grow. And then 15 to 20 years, they're more ready for abstract learning, formal STEM instruction, or self-taught. They can really excel there. Okay, so to end, can play replace school? Yes, it absolutely can. And I love this little poem I'm going to recite. I tried to teach my child with words. They often passed him by unheard. I tried to teach my child with books. He only gave me puzzled looks. Despairingly, I turned aside. How can I teach this child? I cried. Into my hand, he placed the key. Come, he said, and play with me. Well, that's by Anonymous. Um, so, yeah, I would like to open it up to questions now. And um, if here's if you want to know more about following my, our journeys. <laughs> my last child has entered university, so we're almost um, done our formal education. And now lifelong learning continues. We're, we're avid world schoolers. So we're, we're really, it's so much fun to travel with your adult kids too, because they pull their weight, they carry their own stuff and um, they, they continue learning. Learning is lifelong. It never ends, which is fantastic. Past. Somebody has shamed them mm -hmm. about math. So if you if a child has been shamed about math and then they're trying to learn calculus, it's much more difficult. Right. So I I, I think that that's a huge thing that your kids didn't didn't experience. Another thing that you touched on very briefly was confidence. Your uh, college student, when he learned that he needed to learn, he wanted to learn cursive writing. He was so confident that he was humble enough to start with a first grade book. If he has that skill, he can learn anything. 
because many of my students in math, the high school students, college students, when they get to something they don't remember, they don't want to go back and, and go to an earlier grade or earlier level to learn it. Mm -hmm. Like they, they feel like um, somehow it, they're, they, that's just not okay with them. Yeah. And with your children, it was okay. Anytime they get stuck, they're like, oh, I'll just go to an earlier level, learn that, and then come back. Yeah. Yeah. I Those are good points. And I, I really remember when I was in grade seven and we had a math teacher and we were just learning equations and he would call students up to the board. And so you're, you're right in front of your peers if you don't know it, he, he would humiliate people and, and call them names and just put the fear of math into them while they're standing up there just being totally humiliated. And um, I think that ended math for me. <laughs> and luckily, I had a grade eight teacher who was the best math teacher ever. He was so funny. And it's funny how you remember the worst and the best. But um yeah, and I, I, I agree. I think um, you, kids should never, ever be shamed for learning or making mistakes. Absolutely not. And I seen that happen so much, even now in some schools, it does happen, not all schools, but in what I've seen when my kids went to school for two years. And I think, um, yeah, and I, all my kids actually had to learn cursive writing because they had been online all their lives you know gaming and and they've never actually held a pen and pencil and it actually hurts <laughs> when they use it but but I'm glad that they they weren't affected by the grade one on the book <laughs> so but thank you for your comments that's mm -hmm. very interesting do we have any more questions I'm going to start reading the chat box if nobody hi judy um i do have a question hi um, Dilipa. i am from sri lanka so um unschooling self-directed ed is is absolutely innovative in our country uh, so i'm an unschooling mom um uh and also i run a space uh, with 12 kids who are in schooling. Um, often I get comments saying, oh, so do you have some special kids? Um, so what do you do with them? It's, 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 all, it's all projected, you know, the mainstream projects things like, okay, so you must be having some children who struggle um, some, somehow with the impression that there's something wrong with them and that's why you're not putting them in school. So this is happening now in 2023, right? And your, your, when you started unschooling, that was many, many years ago, um, you mentioned saying internet was just started, right? It would have been even more difficult at that time when you really access to knowledge and information wasn't uh, that available at, at fingertips. Did you go through that phase? And if you did, how did you overcome those um, perception challenges of, you know, the rest of the world, the rest of the people that you came across and questioning you um, nearly all the time? What are you doing? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I So I started unschooling in 1999. And um, I didn't even tell my husband what I was doing. <laughs> and I was one of those people that were very skeptical. I remember my first experience with a friend who um, who was unschooling and her, her child asked how long a French fry was. And she said, oh, I think that's about seven centimeters. And I went, what, that's it? That's, that's your math lesson? And then it was in homeschooling my kids and realizing that when I taught a lesson and it was completely gone from their brain the next week, 
And I realize in school, they, they do repetition over and over and over again, so that kids keep, keep, keep those skills up. And in homeschooling, we would just teach a skill, finish that booklet, check it off, done, put it away, go on to the next one. And I, I could observe that my kids wouldn't remember anything until about age 12, 13. And that's when I thought, okay, why am I doing all this? Because they're not retaining anything. Um, I hate teaching. <laughs> and uh, let's just play. <laughs> so, um, so I didn't tell my partner and I didn't tell anybody. Actually, I didn't tell anyone we unschooled. I, I like to say I came out of the closet when my kids went to university. I had three in university start at the same time. And that's when I decided to write the book and come out of the closet. Because um, people, you're right, people um, are, they have a lot of misconceptions on learning and how kids learn and and it's, it's very hard to always counteract those. So what I'd like to do now is I say, um, how about you read a book on unschooling? And there's a lot of books out there. I, I like my book because it focuses on STEM, but there are a lot of really good books on unschooling. And then I say, then let's have a conversation about it because I just feel like I'm always, you can't do it justice in a few 10 minutes kind of thing you have to um, people need to have a whole brain shift and they can get that when they're reading a book if they're that interested if they're not interested then <laughs> then we're not going to have that conversation <laughs> and then I just say well we just do what's okay for our family <laughs> and then leave it at that but yeah it's really hard um, anytime I know in Canada, anytime unschooling hits the news, usually it's a very negative piece and it just feeds those myths out there. So I like to, I like to seek out um, really positive stories on unschooling um, where, you know, people can see. And I think since COVID, it is received a bit more positively. So, yeah, I don't know. I hope that helps. Okay, we have some hands. Yeah. Um, Deb. Deb, you have your hand up. Hi, I'm another Canadian uh, from Toronto. I hey. associated <laughs> with Alpha Alternative School. Uh -huh. Um, and there, I, I, I have to say that 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 everything you talk about in terms of, of, of developmental is, is certainly confirmed by what happens at alpha. Um, it's, it's, uh, and what I'm actually a science nerd. I'm a, a writer and artist by profession, but I did spend uh, 15 years as a fortunately an alternative and arts educator, partly at alpha. And in 10 years at alpha, I saw a lot of kids go through uh, from age four up. Um, we let them play a lot when they're really young. And for me, as I'm a science nerd, I'm a science fan. Um, and we brought, uh, we have a lot of animals at Alpha. And we start all, to me, science, uh, even some very progressive kind of teachers still separate out mm -hmm. science and say, well, we're doing science now. And this is the experimental method. And, and a lot of, certainly the younger kids find that very alienating. For me, the root of science is inquiry. So if you don't stop kids from answer, asking questions and if you're if you uh, allow, give them opportunities and help them follow through on their own inquiries, it often draws in other kids. It's uh, it becomes a whole exploration and science knowledge and math knowledge. They're all interconnected mm -hmm. and you can enter from any point um, in those in those whole areas. So a, a lizard can take you anywhere. A rock can take you anywhere um dinosaurs can take you anywhere that was my first experience so the, the and the kids all absorb an awful lot of general knowledge through watching each other's explorations and through just being able to inquire and never having that uh that squeezed out of them so thanks thanks now read your book and this is mine this is my book about alpha that's just out this year 
Oh, nice. Yeah. Can this be school? Thanks. That's awesome. That is so awesome. And you're in Toronto. That's great. Yes. Where are you? I'm in Calgary. Oh, I'm from Calgary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We yeah. have we have a huge unschooling um community in the province because it is totally, totally um encouraged by the government and we get funding. Wow. To- yeah. <laughs> it's great. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, thank you for your comments on inquiry and how, yeah, everything is just so related. Um, I remember one year we cut down a tree in our backyard and we tried to dig out the stump and then it rained and it became all mud. And we had all the neighborhood kids. We had 20 neighborhood kids over. They were all school age. And they were making building cities out of the mud and the sticks and and um, learning about earthworms and trying to figure out with the wetness what would what would stay, what would collapse. And they had so much fun, so much learning. Um, they were dirty. <laughs> like we sent them home when they had to go to the bathroom, but <laughs> it was just so much fun to watch kids enjoy science and math you know just by by playing and learning yeah and we find one thing we find a lot of the kids who are slower to come to literacy at alpha uh, spend all their early almost all their early time building and often they actually take to math is when when they their nervous system start being able to settle down about about age uh, seven eight nine they can put a few things on paper they often turn out to be very good at math after they've been building for all those years and their parents have been worrying about them because they're just playing right they do just fine yeah yeah absolutely I wish I wish there was some way we could just communicate um, and I found this. Um, at teachers speaking at teachers conferences this year is how to communicate to parents on how valuable play is and 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 that's a concern for teachers is how to sell it to parents and how much learning comes from play yeah okay we have um we have some questions from michael and woon um did you want to just unmute and chat yeah um (laughs) Thanks. I was a little late to your presentation, but I think I get the gist of it. Uh, I'm in, I'm just north of Vancouver, BC on the West Coast. Um, I'm a lifelong career educator and uh, experienced home, home learning father, helped to start a couple of home learning programs in BC, including self-designed learning community, which has got close to 3000 kids in it now, um, government sponsored as well. And, uh, but my First comment would be, I have a comment and a question. My comment is 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 in support of of uh, you know the, the ability of for kids to um, uh, to learn math uh, in in all kinds of ways, and that it's per- pertinent to, about my daughter. She's now twenty nine, but when we home homeschooled her for many years when she was a kitty, and. Uh, and then she said, I want to go to the local high school for grade 10. And my wife and I said, sure, if that's what you want to do, we support that. And I said, you know, you're going into math and, uh, you know, that might be a little tricky there. And uh, um, said, I said, maybe I could tutor her. And we went and got a textbook and never looked at it. And then she started in grade 10 and teach her phone like the first couple of days saying, oh, my God, your child has never taken math. What are you thinking? And And I just said, you know, why don't you just go along with the program here for a bit she's a really smart kid and uh, let's see how this uh, unfolds well my daughter um never needed a minute of tutoring she was helped by her friends and probably pretty good teaching and her own uh innate learning abilities and she thrived in math she she got a in grade 10 math she got a in grade 11 math and in grade 12 math she took calculus to raise her grade she wanted to go on to university, and she ended up getting perfect in the grade 12 uh, provincial exam in calculus at that time. So it was pretty, pretty remarkable story, a testament to, uh, to, to, that, to that ability. If, you, you know, if we just you know, get out of the way sometimes and trust kids, especially our own. Um, 
and I totally agree with with some of your other other comments, uh, um, Judy. Uh, you know, um, to my question, um, I've talked myself into a pretty interesting project these days, and it's with something known as the Prison Math Project. It's based in the states, and uh, it's prison prisonmathproject.org is the website for this group, but it is it it is oriented to helping. Uh, prisoners in the states, men and women who are incarcerated, learn some math skills. And uh, um, it was started by a fellow who's now a recognized math prodigy, doing very hard time for some very bad crimes years ago. His name is Christopher Hitchens, but um, Christ Christopher Havens, excuse me. And uh, anyways, um, uh, my column is that I have in their newsletter uh, is. is just to try to support prisoners. And I don't know how, how diffuse that my audience is at the moment. There are two and a half million people incarcerated in, in the US at the moment, is to my understanding. Um, this, this has enormous potential, but I wonder if anyone in the group here might recommend some resources that I would recommend to this audience of um, I believe, you know, an awful lot of people and some of the assumptions I make about the audience are that these are people who did not likely have much success in school. They're now adults. They, many of them come with learning disorders and learning issues. And I'm just wondering if anybody has a, um, a favorite resource they might recommend, whether they can bring it forward now, or I will put my, uh, um, my email address in, uh, uh, in the chat here yeah. and uh i'd really appreciate hearing from you so there's my email address there's my comment and my question thanks so much okay awesome yeah if you can help them out that great that's oh that's such a good idea too because that's there's so many great jobs that that require math and and especially for rehabilitation after they get out that would be wonderful um Okay, we have um, um, we have another hand up. Um, Woon Chai Ping, would you? Yeah. you yes. Hi. Uh, hi. Th thank you for sharing your story. Actually, it's helped me a lot. I'm new to unschooling. I unschooling my son just a few years ago. And uh, what have you explained is what I have uh, observed for my for my son, and um, he pick up reading uh, by himself. He 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 decided to do his uh, activity everything by himself, but because I'm from Malaysia, so unschooling is illegal. So uh, I don't have much resources. Well, the resources for me, and uh, I, I always took him outside in uh, library, etc. So now we we live in France. So uh, in France, uh, there's a compulsory education policy. So which means uh, every school must go to uh, every children must go to school uh, when they reach uh, three years old. If not, we have to do some uh, specific uh, special application. Well, anyway, so now we are unschooling, and then um, but to fulfill the criteria. So somehow we have to teach him how to do mathematics and do some writing. And I actually realized that the moment I start to teach him mathematics, he he got some back off and then he start to say, um, oh, I really don't like mathematics, but I don't want this to happen because it's, it's like what you say, mathematics in, in our daily life, I don't want him to hate. It. Like I have been used to uh, the, the traditional school of mathematic learning, and I don't want this happen to him. Mm -hmm. So, what you say, I think you a lot of your sharing. Not only you and other participants give me the encouragement. So I actually decided, like when you share your talk, then I say, okay, now it's time as well to listen to what's, uh, what's going on out, out there. And then, so trying to find a way to make him not using paperwork, but as what you have suggested. 
So as also like I have continuing my PhD study. So recently I do some data collecting. So from what parents and unschooling learners told me when this when they decided to learn something, they will they can do it. They learn it. Uh, it's like what you have shared. No matter how how old are them, they can they can just pick up one year, two years. So my question is. What do you think is the most important roles as parents should should play in this unschooling journey? Okay, great. Um, I would say your role is facilitator. So, um, yeah, teach. If they want to know something, you know, you're not going to not tell your kids. If they want to know why is the sky blue, or um, why does planes leave um, a white mark on the sky. So your job is to say, well, let's find out, right? Back to that inquiry, because the motivation is coming from them. They want to know. And then you go and look it up and show them how they can look it up. So now you're doing computer skills. You're looking up science and follow their lead. If they're done, they're, they got all the information they need to know. That's fine. Let it go. Um, if they want to know more, they'll ask you more. So, and then your job is also to get them things they can't get. So, for example, my kids wanted to learn how to weld when they were like 14. <laughs> so I had to find a, a maker studio or class where they could learn welding. I had to drive them there and I had to pay for it. So that's my job is to facilitate what they want to learn. Doesn't matter what it is. If they need help doing it, I can help. Um, I also want to say, too, if you go to my blog, unschoolingtouniversity.com, um, there's a post called Create a Learning Environment that Teaches Without Textbooks, right there. And that's where those sheets were of all the games, um, books, games, and toys that teach certain subjects. So if you go to math, if you don't want to teach math through worksheets, absolutely, if you don't want to, but you know, where you live in France, they want to see evidence of learning, you can um, play all these games with your kids and just take a picture of you playing the games. Maybe that would would work as um, as proof. So I would suggest that. Um, we're almost running out of time. I think I, I think we are out of time. It's 1131. So um, I think we'll just call it there. If I can answer any questions personally, feel free to um, contact me. Here's my email address, journal at shaw.ca. And I would be happy, happy to chat with you further on this topic. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Um, thank you, Peter and Jerry, for hosting this fabulous conference again, 20th year. That's that's fantastic. So, um, yeah, I think I will turn off the recording, I guess. And um, thank you all for coming.